On August 8, 2022, after two long days of travel from Toronto, Ontario, our group of six friends found ourselves on the shore of the Mackenzie River in Fort Simpson, Northwest Territories. Our plan was to fly into the Nahanni National Park Reserve and complete a self-guided voyage down the incredible 216-kilometer stretch of the South Nahanni River from Virginia Falls to Nahanni Butte over 10 days. <laughs> Few wilderness canoe destinations the world over have been documented and celebrated to the extent of the fabled South Nahanni River in Canada's Northwest Territories. The river valley and its surrounding wildlands, the rugged Mackenzie Mountains, are famous for their immense natural beauty. This is a land of towering 3,000 foot canyons, cathedrals of limestone, castles of sandstone, of Virginia Falls, one of the largest waterfalls in the world. A land of spectacular karst terrain, cave systems, hot springs and gemstone lakes, northern lights, wild rapids, roaming grizzly bears and wood bison. This is a place with a river that flows through a greater diversity of landforms than virtually anywhere else on the planet. This is the land of the Dene, comprising the Daycho First Nations who have called the Nahanni and the Mackenzie River home for some 10,000 years. This is a place of great human history and legends, such as the lost tribe of the Naha, or the trapper tales of a hidden tropical paradise amongst the mountains, one inhabited by mastodons and mammoths. Perhaps most famous of all is the legend of the lost McLeod gold mine, which emerged with the unexplained discovery of decapitated prospectors Willie and Frank McLeod in 1908. The wonders of the Nahanni are so great that they earned the site the world's first UNESCO World Heritage designation in 1978. This designation reflects the fact that the Nahanni River is, to cite the selection committee, one of the most spectacular wild rivers in North America. For me, my dream of the Nahanni was sown many years prior to our arrival through an old National Parks documentary that left images of the breathtaking canyons and landscapes of the Nahanni seared in my memory. The dream was stoked in more recent times through the writings and stories of old Nahanni Valley explorers, trappers, and prospectors such as Dick Turner, Albert Faley, and Raymond Patterson. And now, after many years of anticipation, it was hard to believe that we were finally here. At the docks, we were greeted by friendly Parks Canada interpretive staff who are housed summer long at Virginia Falls and directed us back into the bush to find a place to set up camp. Four members of our group, Emily, PJ, Zach, and myself, had arrived here on board the first of two flights. Our remaining party members, Kevin and Lachlan, would arrive within a few hours, and with this extra time to spare, we decided to hike down to Virginia Falls to check out the view. Virginia Falls, or Na Ilicho, Dene for Big Falling Water, is one of the world's great waterfalls. Here, three billion cubic feet of water careen over the edge of a sheer drop, 
of 316 feet, twice the height of Niagara Falls, into Nahanni's Fourth Canyon. The waterfall is divided by an immense limestone spire known as Mason's Rock, so named for Bill Mason, one of Canada's most celebrated canoeists. Above the falls, the relatively placid waters of the Nahanni rapidly transition into a series of class five and six rapids as the river winds slightly to the east and then to the south before reaching the brink. Here, Mason's Rock defiantly divides the river in two, deflecting turbulent spray 40 or 50 feet into the air. When standing at the brink, the raw, unfettered power of Virginia Falls of the Nahanni itself can be felt through your bones. The following morning, after breakfast, we ferried across the river in our canoes from our campsite to attempt to hike Sunblood Mountain. The hike, which involves 1,000 meters of elevation gain and requires about eight hours to complete, is regarded as one of the best hikes on the Nahanni. From the trailhead, we hiked through a tangled web of paths, cutting through spruce trees along the valley floor to the foot of the mountain. At this point, the trail rises precipitously towards the northeast over treacherous scree, holding a scenic view of the top of the falls before veering north along the mountain's prominent eastern ridge. Spruce grouse and fluttering whiskey jacks greeted us as we pushed further through the forest up the dramatic incline. Eventually, we passed into the alpine, which exposed us fully to the blistering summer sun. We then met a final rock face and clambered up to the summit after about four or five hours of hiking. The view from the top is nothing short of stirring. From the distant northwestern horizon, the Nahanni River winds its way through the mountain valley, past the camps along the western shoreline, over the brink of Virginia Falls, and into the massive palisades of rock that characterize Fourth Canyon. To the southwest, Marengo Creek shimmers as it lazily dances through the mountains to meet the Nahanni. To the southeast, a substantive dominant ridgeline can be seen stretching across the landscape, some 30 kilometers away. This represents the location of the Flat River, the largest tributary to the Nahanni and a storied waterway in its own right. The summit of Sunblood yields the South Nahanni Valley in its otherworldly splendor. Around us, the fresh wind pulsed in chilly gusts. Arctic ground squirrels frolicked about amongst wild flowers. Below us, emerald-colored lakes freckled the valley. Oxbows, cliffs, crevasses, hoodoos, and other incredible features lay before us in the crisp summer light. Of times like these, Thoreau once wrote, quote, when the wild river valley and the woods were bathed in so pure and bright a light as would have waked the dead, there needs no stronger proof of immortality. O death, where was thy sting? O grave, where was thy victory then? With our gear packed up in the morning, we loaded our boats at the Virginia Falls dock and made a brief paddle along the shoreline to the portage trailhead near the top of the falls. Here we began the lengthy task of hauling our gear to the base of Virginia Falls via the 1.3 kilometer portage trail on the southwest side of the river. About 70% of the trail is a well-maintained wooden boardwalk with the final section of trail winding down a series of dirt switchbacks. The end of the trail gives way to a long rocky beach which, at river level, provides the iconic rainbow-adorned vantage of Virginia Falls commonly seen in photographs.
Rock and roll, buddy. Yeah, stay in the center. We're gonna hit some big waves here. Keep us straight. Yeah. Keep us straight. With a cool breeze at our back and under the gentle mist of the falls, we set off into the fourth canyon in the early afternoon. The route around the first bend in the canyon seemed straightforward. However, as soon as we rounded the corner, we were confronted by immense standing waves that launched the bows of our boats high into the air and downward deep into each trough. Take us inside. Keep us left. Yeah, yeah. I see a couple monsters up there. Yeah, I think we can do a straight down. Good job. Left, yeah. stay left. No, it's okay, we're good, we're good. Just let's, let's just let it go. Let's, let's actually do a back paddle, keep us straight, but we'll do a back paddle. Wow. <laughs> that they are. I think regardless, we're gonna get pushed left. So we're gonna have to stay away from that wall over there. Yeah. Keep us right. Good job. Keep us straight here, right through this. Paddle, 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 paddle. Yes, keep us left, left, left. There's another one. Paddle straight, hard. Paddle hard, paddle hard. Yeah, still, they're still here. Easy does it. Straighten us into the waves.
There's a big rock in the middle of the river. I don't know where to go around it, to be honest. We gotta. I think we go to the left, buddy. There's two big rocks there. I think we go to the left. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we go to the left over here. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Cut through to the right of this, and then. That was a big one. Straight. We had now passed beyond the limestone crags of 4th Canyon, a remarkable place that we all probably struggled to savor amongst the chaos of the waters. We had arrived at the Nahanni's confluence with Marengo Creek where we stopped to bail out our boats before paddling forth toward Figure 8 Rapids. Keep it straight, keep it straight. Past the blue gurgling waters of Clearwater Creek, yeah. we soon arrived at Figure 8 Rapid, so named for the churning whirlpools here that form something resembling the number eight. Historically, this rapid has had the nastiest reputation of any on the South Nahanni. In Raymond Patterson's book, The Dangerous River, he describes the rapids as follows. It was an amazing sight, though by no means designed to make the voyager burst into a, any hymn of thanksgiving. It was figure of eight rapid, the most dangerous bit of water on the lower river, now known as Hell's Gate. In recent years, however, high waters have entirely altered the rapid and washed out its most challenging features. Fortunately, we were able to pass through figure eight with little effort, but did note the presence of turbulent boils moving through the small canyon below. We soon reached the Nahanni's confluence with the Flat River and pulled our boats up onto the beach at the point where the two rivers met. On the shore we noticed scores of black bear prints which we followed about 200 meters upstream along the beach of the Flat River. The prints led us to a good campsite along the tree line where we decided to stop for the night. By now the blue skies we enjoyed for the better part of the day had been replaced by an ever darkening gloom. As we set up a fire rain began to fall and we decided to turn in for the evening. Before the day was out, however, we were treated to a beautiful misty sunset that cast a full rainbow over the adjacent mountain ridge to our site. In the morning, we pushed off the edge of the flat river and came to its junction with the Nahanni. It was fascinating to see the difference in clarity between the two rivers and to watch the waters blend at their merger. The flat appears relatively clear, while the Nahanni is opaque and extremely silty, so much so that it's possible to hear the silt hissing off the hull of the canoe as the boat glides through the water.
paddled casually past Vera Creek and into Third Canyon, which runs approximately 40 kilometers through the heart of Nahanni's funeral range. Third Canyon is a sight to behold. Tall, sheer peaks tower endlessly over large sections of scree and loose sediment, with the Snaking River winding its course below. The canyons have a special and unique character. Unlike the pure, sheer limestone canyons found elsewhere on the river, the raw composition in Third Canyon is comprised of limestone shale and sandstone. Indeed, these canyons are somewhat reminiscent of the sandstone mountains found in the canyonlands of the American Southwest. The river is pushing through the canyon and we tackled several minor sets of rapids before arriving at the gate where we unloaded our boats to set up camp. The gate is one of the many truly remarkable features of the Nahanni. It is here that the river completes an abrupt hairpin turn through a 460 meter precipitous and narrow passageway in the river. Through the gate lies Pulpit Rock, an iconic pillar of rock that rises vertically out of the river. The campsite at the gate provides an excellent vantage of the area and affords access to the summit of the gate's eastern wall via a short but vertical and extremely scenic hiking trail. You hear that? That was the, that was the rock I threw. <laughs> Given the picturesque nature of the campsite at the gate, we'd resolved to use one of our rest days here. Little did we know, however, that our plans would soon change as a result of an uninvited visitor. Just before eight in the morning, I woke up in my tent to the sound of a hollow thud of one of our canoes striking a rock. I ignored the sound at first, believing it was my imagination, but when I heard the sound repeat, I knew something was awry. I emerged from my tent and peered down to the shore about 50 meters away to find a juvenile black bear sitting inside one of our canoes. Concerned for our spray skirts and other latent gear, I started yelling at the bear, which in turn looked up and walked five or six steps toward me before stopping and gazing in my direction. I walked closer to the bear, shouting louder. By now, everyone else had awoken and joined me wide-eyed at the shore, not knowing what to expect. Lachlan discharged a bear banger which hardly phased the creature. However, with some effort, our shouting did cause the bear to back off to the edge of the forest where it continued to observe us. We approached the canoes and found that the bear had caused a seven-inch tear in one of our spray skirts. Thinking we had scared the animal away, we returned to camp, but almost instantly noticed that it had returned to the proximity of our boats, this time pulling one of our dry suits to the edge of the forest. Again, with great difficulty, we managed to usher the bear back into the woods. The cycle repeated itself on four or five occasions before the bear finally left the site, seemingly for good. In discussing the situation, to avoid further damage and loss of gear, we collectively decided to leave the site and to inform the duty warden via emergency communication device. The bear, though small in stature, was clearly habituated and had no fear of humans. After returning home from the Nahanni and discussing the incident with park staff by telephone, I learned that a two-week closure at the gate that had occurred earlier in the summer was a result of an incident in which a bear had torn open the side of a tent at night with campers sleeping inside. Yep. Goodbye, campsite. Goodbye, bear. Moving on from the incident, we paddled on through the gate bound for the Big Bend. Passing through the gate is a surreal paddling experience. The immense scale of the narrow canyon walls, which absolutely dwarf canoeists, imposed a hush over our group as each of us ceased paddling 
and looked up to admire the towering temples of rock above us. Emerging from Third Canyon, the country opens up again into a large valley that rounds a large corner in the river called Big Bend. Ultimately, we found a good sheltered spot for our camp at the top of a silty beach situated along a dense patch of trees. The spot provided a wide, mountainous panorama that yielded a beautiful orange sunset. The sunset was followed by a slow emergence of a broad carpet of stars and then ultimately some of the most incredible northern lights I had seen. At first, the lights appeared faintly over the distant mountains to our north, before suddenly increasing in strength and flickering and pulsating all over the sky. At one point, the lights danced in a band of light that extended across the sky overhead from horizon to horizon. The following day began with a quick paddle downstream and a pit stop to hike the shallow creek at Painted Rocks Canyon. Painted Rocks Canyon takes its name from the red pigments that line the canyon walls and coat the rocks scattered on the canyon floor. After a brief hike up the scenic canyon, we decided to turn around and return the way that we came. The next major landmark on the river is Second Canyon. The day was blistering hot and the heat radiated intensely off the canyon walls, a sensation that was compounded by the fact that we continued to wear our dry suits through this section. The most scenic portion of the canyon, in my view, is the portion that approaches Scow Creek. Here ahead of us was an enormous sheer cliff face that extended 1,300 meters above the river. Eventually, the river through Second Canyon emerges in a spectacle of some magnificence into the broad expanse of Dead Men Valley. The scenery of the valley is starkly different than that of the canyons prior, with rolling, flat-topped mountains, the headless range, looming prominently over distant horizons. Dead Men Valley, the headless range, and the funeral range all derive their title from the story of the lost McLeod mine. It is understood that in 1906, brothers William Frank McLeod departed upriver to attempt to access the Klondike via the Nahanni Mountains. Two years later, their bodies were discovered, headless and tied to a tree by a search party led by their brother, Charlie McLeod. Rumors had spread in the region that, before their demise, the men had been successful in finding a bountiful gold mine in the valley. Speculation has led to dozens of expeditions to discover the mine, resulting in at least 20 deaths and disappearances. Beyond the McLeod brothers, the early 1900s brought many intrepid travelers to this perilous region in search of fortune. 
numerous mysterious tales of death and disappearance in the mountains in the early 1900s gave the Nahanni a reputation as a cursed river. In 1917, for instance, the decapitated corpse of a prospector named Martin Jorgensen was found alongside his burned cabin near the Flat River. In 1945, the headless body of another prospector, Ernest Savard, was also found in the valley. The causes of the innumerable fatalities and disappearances in the Nahanni during this era generally remain a mystery. Dene oral tradition provides fascinating insight into the history of this valley pre-European contact as well. It is said that the mountain-dwelling Naha tribe lived in Deadman Valley. This hostile tribe was known to periodically invade lowland Dene settlements. In conflict with the Naha, Dene warriors had mounted an attack on their settlement near Prairie Creek, only to find it completely abandoned, with the Naha never seen again. Some speculation persists that the Navajo people of the southwest United States are descendants of the Naha. This, given similarities in Navajo and Dene dialects and stories of a large tribe from the north suddenly appearing in the desert lands. Late in the afternoon, we encountered the Dead Men Valley Warden Cabin and Check-In Station and decided to pitch our tents here. After dinner, we rambled down a kilometer-long trail at the northwest end of the site and came across an old forestry cabin that is best known as the Nahanni's famous Paddle Cabin. Over the decades, hundreds of canoeists have carved small wooden paddles and left them here to dangle like floating spirits in commemoration of their passage through the mountains. Within the cabin, the slightest movement or gust of air causes the paddles to clatter together in a hollow, ghostly toll. Each paddle tells a unique story of the river. Together they are a fascinating and humbling monument to the Nahanni. You see the island on the left there, eh? Let's try to hit that. From the warden's cabin, it is a short paddle to the entrance of First Canyon. Here we were greeted by a lone doll sheep scrambling effortlessly along the steep shoreline. After admiring the strange animal for a while, we pulled our boats up onto a long cobble island to scout a notoriously tricky rapid known as George's Riffle. The rapid is characterized by large and irregular waves at center right and can largely be bypassed by paddling to the left shore of the river. We opted to run as much of the rapid as possible through the center and repeatedly crash through massive cresting waves into the air before smashing back down into the furious flow.
First Canyon boasts the highest vertical walls of any canyon in the park and is commonly regarded as one of the most spectacular places on the river. Peter Jowett, a former warden and author of Nahanni, The River Guide, calls this the most dramatic canyon in Canada. We duly took our time, slowly floating along the river and did little paddling to prolong and savor our experience here in First Canyon. After some time, we arrived at Lafferty's Creek, where we planned to take a rest day, and encountered guided groups occupying two campsites along the shore. We were fortunate to find a third campsite location on the far southern edge of the mouth of Lafferty Creek, and staked our tents on a silty beach. Here we could sporadically catch the scent of sulfur traveling up the river from Krause Hot Springs two to three kilometers to the south. As sundown set in that evening, a stout wind picked up from the north, which thrashed our campfire violently and lifted up large clouds of silt from the dried bed of Lafferty's Creek. We each clamored to reinforce our tents with rocks and guy lines before heading to bed and hoped the sandstorm would abate soon. To our collective dismay, however, the windstorm had intensified in the night, with gusts of wind likely reaching over 80 or 90 kilometers an hour, strong enough to repeatedly flatten some of our tents and push silt up through the screens underneath the tent flies. After breakfast, we decided to hike up the dry, bouldery bed of Lafferty's Creek towards the top of the plateau. As we walked, we noted various cave openings speckling the surrounding canyon walls. The large cliffs that overlook the mouth of Lafferty's Creek from the north contain Grot Valley, the largest cave system in the park with over 200 caves and 2 kilometers of tunnels and passageways. These caves are a feature of the karst lands of the Nahanni Plateau. Over eons, water pooled atop the plateau and drained through the porous limestone to carve out cave systems that still exist to this day. These caves, which are restricted to visitors of the park, hold an array of natural treasures, such as 350,000-year-old stalactites and stalagmites, the skeletons of doll sheep that died within the cave system over 2,000 years ago, and a passageway called the Crystal Passage, for the feathery ice crystals that adorn its walls. The riverbed climbs high through the canyon, eventually leading to a smooth, narrow slot canyon flooded with ice-cold meltwater. We followed the chasm and waded through the water, but ultimately came to a dead end. Oh man, that's going to be deep and cold. Oh. She did it without complaining. Okay. Oh, I'm holding this stuff over my head. After retreating back to the front of the slot canyon, we were able to find a way up and over the obstruction and emerge into the valley closer to the plateau. It appears as though it would have been possible with much more time and effort to eventually climb to the plateau, but we decided to head back to camp at this point. The first task of the morning's paddle was to complete Lafferty's riffle, which each of the boats did without incident.
brief paddle past Lafferty's took us to Krause Hot Spring, where we beached our boats on a gravel bar and stepped out into warm, ankle-deep water. The submerged rocks at our feet were covered in a spectrum of whites, greens, and yellows, a result of bacteria flourishing in the hospitable conditions of the hot spring where it met the river. Over the bank of the river is a small rotting cabin and check-in station. The cabin is a remnant of the homestead of Mary and Gus Kraus, who lived here intermittently over 30 years beginning in 1940. Today, the tattered building, like the forestry cabin at Deadman Valley, is adorned with carved paddles crafted by river travelers over the years. In the center of the large gravel bar at the site, the hot spring trickles into a sizable crystal pool. The water here sits at a temperature of about 35 degrees Celsius and is perfect for taking a relaxing soak despite the persistent smell of rotting eggs. Two right over here. Here we go. Don't worry, Locker, you'll be first. Go all outside of the gun. Taking your life jacket? Krause Hot Springs marks the end of First Canyon in its transition into a region known as the Splits. The Splits are an immense valley that contain dozens of confusing channels known as braids over a distance of more than 60 kilometers. Despite the navigational challenges imposed by the Splits, this place has an incredibly wild and unique feel and for most of its duration, the river maintains a healthy flow. In the distance, large mountains such as the Jackfish Mountain and Twisted Mountain loom prominently over this area. After spotting a cow moose and her calf grazing along the edge of the river, we came to a sign marking the southern edge of the park's boundary. This was not far from the Jackfish River's confluence with the Nahanni. Now less than 40 kilometers to Nahanni Butte, we pulled over to make camp again. The first location we chose was a sandy beach that was covered in hundreds of bison and bear tracks. Thinking it was prudent to relocate, we ferried across the river and found a flat, sheltered spit of grassy land that served perfectly as a campsite, though we were periodically serenaded by buffalo calls over the course of the evening from the wooded area behind our tents. We are now entering the final phase of our journey on the South Nahanni. We paddled past the mouth of the Jackfish River and almost immediately encountered several herds of wood bison, with an occasional stray bull along the riverbanks. It was an amazing sight to behold these creatures, the largest land mammal in North America, in such abundance in their native setting. This privilege was compounded by the fact that these creatures, as other bison species, were on the verge of extinction little more than a hundred years ago due predominantly to overexploitation. Eventually the Nahanni calms to a virtual flat water paddle and slowly meanders towards Nahanni Butte an ever-present landmark in the distance on this leg of the trip. Our journey towards the butte brought us past a large group of trumpeter swans and three independent black bears on approach to town.
After spotting another bear on the muddy flats just outside of town, we hopped back into our boats and paddled around the corner. Here we spotted a long row of fishing boats tied to the muddy riverbank. We had arrived at the small 100-person Dene community of Nahani Butte and were soon unloading our gear to camp at the small clearing in the middle of the community. In the morning, we deregistered at the park office in town and prepped our gear for a boat shuttle that we had previously arranged through Nahanni River Adventures. It is notable that in summer months, the community is only accessible by boat or plane. Our shuttle accordingly involved a boat ride to a seasonal access road upstream on the Liard River, where we would meet a vehicle shuttle to take us back to Fort Simpson. In Simpson, we would transfer our gear to our rental cars and then drive back to Yellowknife. Despite some engine trouble on the boat ride, we eventually made it back to the access road and began the drive back to Fort Simpson as ash fell from the sky from nearby forest fires. By nightfall, we had arrived at Samba Day Falls Territorial Park where we would spend our last night in our tents before driving off to Yellowknife. At around 1.30 a.m., in an effort to catch one final viewing of the aurora, we hiked down to a place on the riverbank in Samba Day called Coral Falls. As though the Northwest Territories had not astonished us sufficiently, the skies were set ablaze with the most intense display of northern lights I have ever witnessed. In the foreword to the 1966 Canadian edition of his famous work, The Dangerous River, Raymond Patterson wrote, the dangerous river tells of trips made in the north just before the airplane made all places accessible to any kind of man. Those of us who had the good fortune to be on the South Nahanni in those last days of the Old North may, in times of hunger or hardship, have cursed the day we ever heard the name of that fabled river. Yet a treasure was ours in the end. Memories of a carefree time and an utter and absolute freedom, which the years cannot dim, nor the present age provide. We were kings, lords of all we surveyed. As wilderness canoeists, we endeavor to explore wild places for many reasons. Physical and mental well-being, to challenge ourselves, to build relationships, to hunt, to fish to heal ourselves and find reprieve, to experience deep sensations of freedom, distance, solitude, to pursue the innate human desire for exploration and knowledge, to see and feel things for the first time, to build bonds with our planet, bridges to our past, and to find meaning. It is true that the reasons we paddle change over time. But for each of us, I would suppose that there was something in the land or perhaps in the feel of the paddle at the beginning of our first forays into the wild that struck us and formed an impression to change us forever. For those who love exploring nature and have done so for many years, to paddle the Nahanni River is to paddle a canoe in the wilderness again for the first time. With childlike wonderment, you will rediscover all the things that first kindled your love for the great out of doors.